fact is, while I try to do my part by recycling and making sure that my e-waste is properly disposed of, there are industrial companies that pour so much pollution into the environment that it really starts to feel like, well, is my individual effort actually making a difference? Well, someone really needs, I mean, we've had this discussion before, Sasha. Mm -hmm. Like, who, who can step up and make a difference? Who can actually help those companies uh, to be able to reduce their footprint? And, in fact, Ship and Shore Environmental Incorporated is here with us tonight. And they're dealing specifically with those environmental issues on a grander scale, using sophisticated technology to help industrial customers, so not us individuals, but the big businesses, to be able to control and reduce and even offset their air pollution. Anusha Askuyan is the CEO of Ship and Shore. Anusha, thank you so much for joining us this week. It's a great pleasure to be here with you, and thank you for the opportunity. Anusha, before we speak about the technology and how your company is combating pollution at the industrial level, I'd really like our viewers to have the opportunity to get to know you uh, on a personal level. Uh, especially at this time, I mean, STEM, STEM education is something that's very prominent today. Um, and it's not just boys uh, who are growing up with a passion for engineering and being encouraged to pursue it as well. Uh, but you got started at a very different time, and I imagine that that led to some challenges. Um, so I'd ask, what inspired you to get into the engineering field and pushed you to see it through despite cultural opposition? Um, to give you a little background about myself, um, I um, came to this country at a very young age and always with the hope and the dream of um, living in America and doing uh, what I love doing and uh, making a new life for myself. And as daring as it was before the revolution took place in Iran, I decided to leave and convince my parents to send me away. I always was at the sciences, but my interest in chemistry, as well as um, getting into a field where there were not very many women involved, was, was of interest. Mm -hmm. um, it was a different time, and when I was going to school, everyone was like, what, what do you want to do with this? Where are you going to take this? Mm -hmm. A lot of questions that I didn't even know how to answer, but I trusted my instincts of following my passion for chemistry and eventually led me to become a chemical engineer. And um, I always had my heart set on uh, wanting to do something to make a difference. And is this something that you've always wanted to do? If I was to say I always wanted to be a chemical engineer, it's probably not correct. My um, interest in chemistry was there due to an amazing teacher I had at a very young age. Mm -hmm. Just like everyone in life, you have one hero that you, it just changes your life and your path of where you want to go. Um, but I always had a sense of entrepreneurial about what I wanted to do and I believed in um, doing things that would be different than what a woman and a girl is supposed to do. Hmm. Um, getting into fields of studies that is very typical wasn't what I had in mind. Um, did I want to do what I do right now? I wouldn't dream of anything else right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love what I do. But uh, staying on the scientific path and staying on wanting to make a difference, I think, was always something I had in mind. Cool. So teachers, listen up. Uh, you can make a world of difference in, in a young life. Um, Anusha, coming from a background such as yours, being born in Iran, um, would women have ever even thought about pursuing this field? Um, I believe um, before the revolution, since the country was very westernized and quite advanced in many fields of studies, and women were very involved with, with everyday life and forming what the country was about, Mm -hmm. um, I think it would have been very possible, but I was lucky enough to leave before the revolution and um, not forgot the dreams I had. If I would have stayed there, um, it definitely would not have been possible. If I would have stayed there, at most I could have perhaps pursued my education, but um, 
just work for a company or uh, or or make the best of my degree, uh, but to what I've made it to be now, mm -hmm. I think it would have been. We lost you there. Yeah, sorry, you just just cut oh, out there. Sorry. sorry, if you just back up just about a, a ten seconds. Sorry about that, folks. Um, I was just mentioning that even in this country, where I am and what I do yes. is um, not a very typical of what a woman would do with the education that I have. And um, I've, had, I've had quite a bit of challenge to make sure that we stay on path and um, continue with the company as I do. We're seeing a lot of change these days, but like back when you were getting started, what, what was really the biggest challenge that you faced, Anusha? Um, getting started, just working as a woman in the chemical engineering field at one point in time when I was hired on a, a, a major EPC company, mm -hmm. they simply wanted to meet their quota of having enough women on board. Oh, and yeah. We, I won't mention names, but that's really <laughs> what they did. And um, and not knowing, and definitely management positions were not as readily available to the women that were chemical engineers. And advancing within a company uh, was was not as as easily as it is achieved nowadays. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy to see so many women powerhouses and CEOs and CFOs in many fields. So getting started was, was quite challenging, and I definitely had enough challenges as a CEO of uh, my company, our company here, to walk into offices and introduce myself as one, and they would, if I did not introduce myself <laughs> with my title, they would always think I was the engineering secretary that came along with a bunch of oh, guys no. to present what the design was going to be. Oh no, so you have a good sense of humor about that, it seems, um, so you kind of put them in their place. I, I do. I have a story. If you have a minute, I could tell you a company that we walked into. Mm -hmm. At one point in time, we did not have titles on our business cards. I walked in with a number of our engineers to make a big presentation. And um, so they invited us to go in. I was the only woman. And the secretary uh, at the front office uh, showed me where the coffee was and if I wanted to get coffee for all the guys that were there. <laughs> <laughs> and get ourselves situated oh, and sit comfortable and we said nothing a um, number of guys were with us and what i did was i i went along and once the uh, clients walked in uh, they would totally ignore looking me in the face and we're talking to the guys asking everybody to make their introduction yeah and they did i went last so once I introduced myself um, <laughs> and told them that I was the CEO of the company, um, literally jaws dropped. And I, it's, it's, a, it's a moment that I always keep vivid in my mind, but I wish I had my iPhone back then. <laughs> <laughs> Anusha, I'll bet that they have not forgotten that moment either. Uh, here you are. I mean, you're the CEO of the company. How did you get from where you were to here? Um... I think, uh, like everyone else, hard work, um, passion for what you want to do, um, seizing opportunities, uh, making sure you stay true to your own inner voice and doing what you really feel like is the right thing to do. And, um, and I should always definitely um, thank my stars lining up to put me where I was and, and um, uh, thanking um, all the various people and elements in life that, that gave me the opportunity. Um, it's, it, it was challenging, um, like I said at the beginning, once we um, even started the company with me at the helm of the um, company, but but over time, I think um, just staying just staying true to to what I wanted to do was was uh, was was quite important. Mm -hmm. And you you kind of set it in order. It's you got to be hardworking. You got to dedicate yourself, and then the opportunities present themselves. 
Um, Anusha, before we get into learning about the actual technology, of course, we're a technology show, so we're going to get there, folks. Um, we want to learn about that tech and how you're, you're using it to help big businesses combat pollution. That's what this is about. Uh, but do you have any advice? I mean, it's not just for young people, but in particular young women, because we are in, an, in a time when like, young girls are now being able to come into uh, engineering and be encouraged to do so. And, and it's an exciting time. But for those kids who are looking at in engineering and other fields like this, what, what advice can you give them? Um, I think it is important for women and young girls um, to uh, truly not let anyone or anything get in their way of wanting to study a particular subject doing the right thing, going after what their passion is. Um, most often, even when I was growing up, I was being told, well, no, girls can't do that. Yeah. Oh, girls can't do this. It, even, even nowadays, um, we find ourselves limiting girls from certain things compared to boys. So my advice has always been, and I do go around um, universities and high schools um, whatever opportunity arises to, to encourage girls to go to scientific fields, to go to mm -hmm. engineering schools and, and um, look at it as a career because God knows we have enough girls that are in the fashion world, we have enough girls that are into what girls are supposed to do <laughs> uh, and we definitely lack the, the brainy ones to come into the engineering field and really be the makers of what the future will, will be and will hold. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I'm really happy to see that uh, you don't necessarily have to be a nerd in order to be an engineer. So you could, you could, you could balance um, you know, smartness with the desire of wanting to do, to do what you're, you're passionate about and um, make a success story out of it. We're speaking with Anusha Oskuyan. Uh, she's actually the CEO of Ship and Shore Environmental Incorporated. And when we return, we're going to be finding out about how their technology works, how it's making an international impact on pollution that is generated by big industry. Stick around. At Ship and Shore Environmental, we provide customized engineering solutions for air pollution abatement. We engineer, design, and fabricate environmental products and systems, including regenerative thermal oxidizers for clients that are required to collect and destroy emissions generated by their manufacturing operations. When you work with Ship and Shore, we become your strategic partner from initial permit application to commissioning, meeting the most stringent air pollution regulations. Ship and Shore matches best abatement technologies to a variety of industrial applications. We have successfully implemented equipment for manufacturing of flexible packaging, plastics, resins, fiberglass, fasteners and coated metals, food products, pharmaceuticals, electronics, as well as safety systems for barge degassing and terminal loading applications. Ship and Shore is an international company serving clients throughout the Americas, Europe and Asia. Our team of experts provides overall engineering and management of environmental projects to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, always aiming to keep utility operating costs down through enhanced energy efficiency and waste heat recovery. Ship and Shore is also instrumental in recovering incentive rebates sponsored through utility providers for new and improved equipment operation. Our skilled teams are available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Contact us now for a free estimate by calling 562-997-0233 or learn more about us at shipandshore.com. I'm speaking with Anusha Askuyan, CEO of Ship and Shore Environmental Inc. Can you perhaps explain to us lay people how your technology works, Anusha? 
Um, yes, Tall order, right? I, <laughs> <laughs> I, well, in general, um, I always say that every um, every uh, successful person, I like to think of myself as one, should have a 30-second, um, as they used to call it, elevator pitch as to what is it that we do. Mm. We um, are an engineering consulting manufacturing company that designs and fabricates and installs anti-pollution control systems for all different types of industrial facilities, all types of manufacturing facilities. Anytime anyone within any factory um, opens up, whether it's a can of paint or a big bucket of chemicals or anything that they process to make things, mm -hmm. uh, we can potentially be there and be helpful in removing any of the pollutants that comes off of the wow. And that is done by um, designing the systems to internally capture and collect all of the pollutants that are usually um, lighter than, they're heavier than air, but light up in the environment where workers are working. Mm -hmm. And we take it all outside to our system where in return we have clean air coming out of the chimneys or stack of our units. Wow. And you've used the, the word design a few times in your response. Um, so are we talking, are these custom designed um, like uh, uh, units that you're using? Um, yes, they are. Every single project we have is custom designed based on the need for, uh, for the facility for any manufacturing operation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And even if manufacturing facilities do the same things, no two systems would be exactly identical because wow. the nature of the business may be different, the size of the requirements may be different, and also their geographic location as to where they are in the country mm -hmm. or even outside of the country dictates what type of technology we will be utilizing to remove um, the pollutants from the facility. Okay. Um, so, Anusha, in your years of working with pollution control, um, what changes, uh, in particular, I'm thinking about like improvements in technology, uh, what have you seen that really has been exciting for you to be personally a part of? Um, I, I can um, candidly and honestly say that in the olden days where removal of these pollution was a um, problem at hand for major, say, refineries, chemical plants, petrochemical plants, right. they were not so concerned about removing them efficiently or destroying them efficiently. The, the goal was let's get rid of them. Yeah, just and bury it. Over Yes. yes. <laughs> Over the years, especially with a lot of technology that we have developed in-house, mm -hmm. we have been able to come up with ways to make this not only the most efficient where you are not spending a lot of um, utility, including gas and electricity, to get rid of this, but also design them such that you could bring back a lot of the heat that becomes available from these type of units back oh. to the plant. So the element of heat recovery, cost conscious <laughs> and utility consciousness has been one of the main things that we focused on. Very cool. So what interest, uh, what industries um, are actually benefiting from your pollution control systems? Um, in, in California in particular, the mecca of air pollution control, because of the very tight controls due to EPA and the local agencies, mm -hmm. um, any one particular manufacturing facility or uh, operation that puts out over some areas four tons of emissions or 10 tons of emission is subject to having to do a control equipment. And that mm -hmm. could um, really be any factory that is processing a, a chemical of some sort to build their equipment. Yeah. If they operate five days a week and only one shift could easily be over that. So this is legislation um, that is in place to say that they have to have some kind of pollution control? It is, yes. Okay. They do or else 
the plants are not given permits to operate or they're not even given a city permit to oh, open wow. up. So it has to become part of that. Some other parts of the country are a little bit more relaxed, mm -hmm. but California, I always use the example, if you flew into LAX, say 20, 25 years ago, you could not see five feet ahead of you mm -hmm. or in front of you because it was just this yellow haze all mm -hmm. over the place and it was extremely polluted. Right now, Los Angeles has really improved tremendously and is among one of the cleaner cities uh, compared to what it used to be. So what we have done, uh, which I am so proud to always share, is we truly have cleaned up the air in the, um, in the vicinity in Los Angeles, LA Basin, San Diego, and most of California due to more stringent rules, which are now becoming the rule um, in the country everywhere else. Wow, and that really brings me to, like, thinking about our like our, our rising concerns about the impact on the environment long term, um, and, and so we are seeing pollution control regulations becoming more strict, um, not just in California but on a global scale. Um, have these new rules had a, a big impact on your clients' industries? Um, one of the one of the areas that I'm always very um, concerned about is to make sure we do the right thing for all existing manufacturing facilities. And I always tell them, just putting a pollution control does not have to break your back. If you design for it properly, it can really benefit not only the environment, and it can be very cost prohibitive in terms of trying to bring some heat back, trying to make them all efficient. So. And I'm a big proponent of keeping industry and manufacturing alive in the U.S. And that is what the country was built on years ago. And I hate for manufacturing sector to leave U.S. and go elsewhere. So the impact um, that I see, uh, there are clients that fear of what this may cost us and just avoid it totally. It does not have right. to be as uh, expensive as they think. And other parts of the world are beginning to adopt these rules and regulations as well. Sure, and we got to look at the big picture too. I love, I never even had the thought that, like, hey, move these things to Canada and keep our, our factories warm, you know? Um, not so much of a problem in California, but certainly up here we could use it. Um, how does Ship and Shore help meet the challenges that these new rules have presented? Because it seems to be ever-changing. We're always hearing about how the regulations are just always being revised. Um, how do you help your customers uh, deal with that? Um, I, I do have the um, opportunity to serve at the um board at South Coast Air Quality Management District very locally, which is a, a large institution for developing a lot of the rules that um, the whole world follows. And I'm part of the back to best available control technology. So we try to stay ahead of what is coming down the pipeline, what is achievable, what is feasible, and try not to really kill the industry by enforcing the most stringent rules on them. Mm. Um, trying to stay ahead of the game, trying to design for future rather than what do you need to do right this minute. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I've always uh, advised a lot of my clients is try to plan ahead. You have a manufacturing, you naturally want to grow, so try to do this all at once and not necessarily have to do it every time you add a piece of equipment or expand your operation. And lastly, I, one of the things I always mention to people is, please take a look at uh, what we do to air and air pollution. We have no geographic boundaries in yeah. the air. Anything we do anywhere, even if we were to send all of this to Canada, it'll eventually come back to us. Anything they do in China, it'll eventually reach us in other parts of the world. So we just cannot say it's not my problem, let somebody else worry about it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, Anusha, how disruptive are the regulations um, and these, like, just the changes that are constantly required? Uh, and, and with that, you know, thinking about all the changes that companies have to make in order to comply with the regulations, uh, is there really going to be a big impact on the air quality long term? 
Um, I think, well, I look at disruptions in two ways. Um, there will not be a disruption in the operations and in the manufacturing sector if they plan for what the pollution control for their facility should be in the long run from the get-go of the design phase. Mm. If they're existing and they need to adopt, um, ad adapt to the new rules, there are ways to, to go about and design a system that would be completely suitable for them. There are a lot of fa facilities that are a mom and pop shop. They're smaller. However, they have to live with the new rules and regulations. So we do design systems that are much more compact, takes really? care of their needs, but doesn't break their, their back. Right. It's that um, scalable. So wow. Yeah, it is scalable. It's not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. It can easily be done for any 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 facility. And um, as long as they have the will to do the right thing, there is a way to, to manage this for them. And I am a big advocate speaking on behalf of the industry with a lot of agencies around to make sure they don't come down with the toughest rules for areas where they're just not able to do it or the technology is not there yet because they can sometimes get a little little uh, crazy, mm -hmm. I should say, by wanting to enforce the worst and the, the technology just is not there to, to support it yet. I see. Um, aside from our interview today, um, I have um, noticed that you've been getting a lot of media coverage, uh, Ship and Shore Environmental, um, with your growth into uh, an international presence, uh, and, and really making a, a big dent on the environmental impact of multinational businesses as well. Um, can you just kind of elaborate on that? Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, uh, we were recently, a few years ago, about three years or so ago, we yes. um, started working closely with China EPA as they were developing their rules. And they were trying to uh, model some of the rules they had after what we've done in California. Mm -hmm. uh, for your information, um, SCA QMD is referred to as the Mecca of Air Pollution Worldwide. So we started working with them, sharing some of the experiences and as a result, we've done a number of projects in China now. Mm -hmm. There is always a start. We won't be able to clean that country in, in, in a matter of a week or a month or a year. Sure. But a start is a good, good way to get going. Uh, we have recently noticed that there's a lot of demand in other uh, Far East countries. We just started having presence in Thailand. Mm -hmm. So as the rules and regulations are tightening up around the world and G20 is encouraging other countries to step up and do the right thing, I think there's only uh, a lot of potential growth for our company as well as for the world um, to look at things globally rather than locally. Sure. And that is what we really need to focus on. Um, how do we impact the world globally? Uh, with, with, with respect to at least the pollution and the environmental issues. And I think um, uh, global warming and uh, climate change are hopefully a topic for another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Anusha, you mentioned that there are some mom and pop shops and smaller businesses that are that are benefiting from your technology. But uh, we're also talking about and taking a look at big industries, these international, multinational companies. Um, but some of these companies have been in business for a very long time. Uh, the challenge there, I'd imagine, is that changing the way that they manufacture in order to meet regulations could be extremely costly. Um, with that in mind, how is Ship and Shore Environmental helping them establish and maintain compliance with these regulations that are, again, just always changing? Um, as, um, as mentioned, uh, we do work with any size of manufacturing facilities. Um, some of the larger ones that have been there and have been doing it without keeping the environment in mind um, either they've been approached by the local air quality as to what is their game plan moving forward. And some of the bigger companies, multinational companies, I have to say, I'm happy to see that they have adopted a new sustainability program. And part of that good, sustainability good. program has been how do you control your pollution and how do you mm -hmm. control your waste? 
So the conscious, the, the companies that are very conscious about it and want to keep the right image, right message, have adopted plans as to how do they uh, roll out the sustainability pro program and our activity does fall within that sustainability program as well. And if for nothing else, uh, one of the things we always say here, um, when these VOCs, volatile organic compounds, referred to as pollutants, are going out of the chimney of facilities, they all have heating value. So if they're captured and brought back to the plant, they can do their heating with what is lost. They could do um, hot water needs, it's amazing. steam needs. Wow. So there are ways to capture this. If you just think about it. Yeah, and, and those are some of the advances we've made that I really um, take pride in all the years that we have with um, some uh, amazingly brilliant people that are working with us here in the company. Awesome. And then just quickly, when you speak of the manufacturing, or pardon me, the design process, are you speaking, like I'm thinking about businesses that have maybe been in business since the 1960s, and like, it, is the design process your product like can you come into a factory like that and improve their facility so that it's not uh, like so that you're offsetting the the pollution that's coming out of there um yes we are able to do that we have i have walked into some facilities believe it or not that have been there for decades wow uh, one thing that happens immediately is the air and the environment within the manufacturing facility becomes much, much better and a lot mm. cleaner. So you've got happier operators, you have happier people inside the plant because till then, nothing was being done and all of this, people were are breathing the fumes in. Yeah. People are breathing. Thinking about the, the healthcare coverage. Yeah. Uh, so you have happier people inside the plant and more productive people as a result. And secondly, we have been able we have never ever failed to design around what is existing in a plant if they choose to move forward and be conscious about uh handling the pollution and pollution control wonderful it can be done and thank god for good engineering practices we're always able to come up with a way to do it beautiful uh, anusha where can our viewers learn more about your technology's impact on the environment well, naturally, it's always great if they go to our website, which is one place we always like to get people to go visit because we have case studies, we have pictures of what has been done. We talk about different industries. Um, naturally, www.shipandshore.com, S-H-I-P-A-N-D-S-H-O-R-E.com. And um, we do have a live chat available, so if someone ever had a question, we, a lot of times we even have students that are doing papers and projects that go to our site and want to learn more. Um, we have students that become intern over summertime. <laughs> um, so we try to keep the educational side of everything um, live and kicking at all times, as well as hoping to be able to gain more clients as a result of whether it's a brand new facility they're building, whether mm -hmm. they want to just become more aggressive in their um, environmental practices, or just, uh, just, just, just wanting to do the right thing. Fantastic. Shipandshore.com. Anusha, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to share with how your company is helping to reduce the world's pollution. Keep up the great work. Thank you so very much, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, love hearing from your audience. If they do have any questions, we'll be more than happy to entertain those. And um, uh, again, thank you. Thanks, Anisha.